Doing every challenge question, this is the applied year one book. I am not going to do this in parts. I am going to do the entirety of the stats from this whole book. And we're going to do that for a few reasons. Partly because it's really easy, because it's stats, but also because there are barely any challenge questions. What there are some of are these large data set questions, which look like challenge questions, but they're not titled challenge questions. They just have a colored background. And I'm, of course, not going to sully my computer by downloading the large data set on it. So I'm, of course, not going to do these questions. I sat here and agreed to do challenge questions, not anything else. So anyway, the first actual challenge question we get to is the very end of chapter two, when we have to mess around with some formulas for mean and standard deviation. So we have 20 things, uh, a mean of 3.1, standard deviation of 1.4. Apparently one of the values said 2.3, but it should have said 3.2, calculate the new mean and standard deviation. So we can find out the total of all the data by doing 20 times 3.1, which is 62. If we remove the wrong piece of data, 2.3, and add in the correct piece, uh, we'll get uh, well, it's a difference of 0.9, so we get an um, increase of 0.9. Divide that by 20, and that finds our new mean. For our new standard deviation, uh, we're going to be thinking about this formula. But firstly, we need to use this formula to work out sigma of x squared. So sigma of x over n for the old data is just 60, yeah, sorry, is just 3.1 or 62 over 20. It doesn't matter what you say. Sig sigma was 1.4. We can rearrange this to find sum of x squared, um, which is great. Sum of x squared is this. I can now remove 2.3 squared from that and add in 3.2 squared to get a new um, sigma of x squared for the new data. I can, of course, put that into this formula forwards with my new mean, or my new total, I should say. With or I could have just put my new mean here, 3.145, and I can calculate sigma correctly as that. Chapter 3, mixed exercise about a histogram. I have done GCSE maths, so I can do histograms. I'm not too afraid of this question. Of course, the area in a histogram is the frequency. The height, therefore, if the area is 4 and the width is 20, the height is 0 0.2. And here, 1.7 divided by 10, height is 1.7. Now, that's good because that means apparently this bar is 3 centimeters higher than this bar, which means 1.5 on our scale is equal to 3 centimeters, which means 0 0.5 is equal to 1 centimeter. Um, I'm thinking about this one here. That's got a height of 9 divided by 20, which is, or sorry, 30, which is 0 0.3. Well, 0 0.1 is going to be um, 0 0.2 centimeters. So times by three, you get 0 0.6 centimeters is the height of this bar here, um, according to my maths there. Let's make a little table, a little sample space for this question here. So we're going to multiply the numbers together. So let's do all that. These are the numbers multiplied. Apparently, x is an integer, and the probability is that y is even. So y is the product, the six values in here, um, and is equal to the probability that y is bigger than or equal to 20. Now, let's look at this. Y is even, has a probability of 1, 2, 3, 4, that's definitely even, possibly 5 and 6 out of 6, depending on X. Now, X, it can't be 6 out of 6, right? If X was even, then every single number in here would be even, and that's not allowed because apparently the probability of that, which would be 1, is just probably that Y is bigger than 20, which isn't 6 out of 6 because of this 8. So X has to be odd. Now, if X is odd, um, this one is still even, remember, because it's two times something. So that means there are four evens, which means I need four numbers to be bigger or equal to 20. I've already got two of them. Um, so if I make x5, this will be 25, and this will be 35, and this will be 10, um, which was fine, because that gives me um, 1, 2, 3, 4 values above 20. If x is 7, that gives me 1, 2, this will be 35, and this will be 49, this will be 14, so that's still good. 8, 9 would also work because that makes this one 18. 11 doesn't work because then this one gets bigger than 20 and throws everything off. And of course, odd numbers were the only thing that works. Therefore, that is the only thing that works. Probability of B is two lots of the probability of A. Um, so therefore, P plus Q plus 0 0.05, which is the probability of B, is equal to two lots of 0 0.15 plus P. You can rearrange this. Um, I'm sorry, first, I guess, probability of not C, which is this plus this plus this plus this, is equal to 0 0.83. You can rearrange both of these, and um, because I, you know, I can sort of, I was going to say something sarcastic. I can solve a simultaneous equation. Thanks. I'll get these two answers. Um, and then you can use these to find r, because you can just plug these values in here, add up everything to make one, and take away r. And, uh, and yeah, cool. Next question independence is, of course, p of a times p of b is p of a uh, uh, intersecting with b, like this. Uh, that's true if they are independent. Prove that A and not B are independent. So let's start here. P of not B is 1 minus P of B. 
it can expand out the brackets. Now, um, if now we're working on the assumption that they've given us that A and B are independent, so therefore this can be written like this. And now, if you get out a quick little Venn diagram, uh, P of A minus well, P of A is this circle. P of A intersected with B is this. So therefore, this minus this is this crescent here, which can be described as P of A intersected with not B. That's this crescent here. And therefore, we've got from this to this. Therefore, those two things are independent. The next thing is going to be exactly the same. Um, not A and not B. We start with uh, this. Um, we can say 1 minus P of B, 1 minus P of B. Expand out a quadratic, essentially, here. Uh, kind of interesting. Um, this, by the independence assumed, that we've assumed, is this. Uh, and now, if you factorize out a minus 1 here, I guess, you can say you can follow a formula here which says p of a plus p of b minus the middle bit um, is just p is just a union with b because this this and this or this and this create a double in the middle which you then remove and you just get the union but of course one minus the union is just the stuff on the outside which you can describe as p of not a intersected p of not b and therefore these two things are also independent Next one, married couples. Um, I decided to do a probability tree here. Probably the wife has retired as 0.4. So wife retired 0.4, uh, yes, 0.6, no. Um, it says if the wife is retired, then the probability husband retired is 0.8. So that's 0.8 there, and that's 0.2 there. Um, I guess as well, I can put in, I'll put in 2.2 in a second. Anyway, give, uh, what else do we say? Um, have I missed something? Uh, yeah, I have missed something. The probability the husband is retired is 0.7. What that means is I can say this branch times this branch plus this branch times this branch equals 0.7 because that's the two ways the husband can be retired. So I've just called this P for a second. I can calculate P using that. And then I've got that as 19 over 30. That is 11 over 30. And this, like I said, is 0.2. And now I can just do some maths. Two married couples are chosen at random. Find the probability one of the two husbands and one of the two wives is retired. There's a few ways to do this. Your first couple could be retired, retired, and second couple not retired, not retired because that's one married and one not married, uh, that's one retired and one not retired from each gender. Um, or you could be wife retired, husband not retired is the first couple, and wife not retired, husband retired for the second couple, which I think is what I've done here. Except also, um, you could swap the couples over, and so we actually get two results for each of these. You can type all of this in and add up the two results, so you get this in total. Good, uh, so we've got probability that x is x is one eighth for all of these different values. Probably the y is y is 1 over y for those values. What's probably that x is bigger than y? If x is 8, it's bigger than y. So that has probability 1, um, which means that overall, because that has an eighth chance of happening, that's an eighth times 1. Probability of 7 being bigger than y is 1, and the probability of 7 happening is 1 eighth. Probability of 6 being bigger than y is only um, one half. Uh, essentially, y can't be a sixth. And the chance of y not being a sixth is 1 half plus 1 third. Um, which is five sixths, I think. Yeah. So the probability of six being bigger than, than anything here is five sixths. Um, yep. Yeah. And, uh, and then you could do five sixths times an eight for the probability of that one. Five is the same as six because this is the only one you can't be. And then we'll add the same thing down here. Four is also the same. Put it down there. Three is only bigger than two. Uh, two has half a chance of coming out, one over two. So that's going to be a half chance of being bigger. So add that to the list. Two um, is actually a zero chance of being bigger than these because it's just not, nor is one. Type down to a calculator, you get this as the answer. A driving test has 50 questions. This person is for some reason certain she got 32. Guess the remaining ones. She needs another 11 questions, correct? So what's the probability of getting 11 out of 18 further questions, correct? With a probability of um, 0 0.25 because there are four answers in each. We want the probability of greater or equal to 11 which is 1 minus the probability of less than equal to 10. I have no idea why this is a challenge question because you've just typed it into a calculator and you get the answer. Next question. Also no idea why this is a challenge question. You assume that the probability is correct and then you just type into a calculator um, stuff that's going to get you close to 0, 0 0.05. Uh, this one, I, I guess 30 to start with. It turns out it's 29. And then you go the other end and try and get as close to 9, 0 0.95 as possible. Um, of course, you, this one, you have to do the one minus thing, I guess. Uh, you get this, uh, go a bit higher than that. Uh, we'll try to get a bit higher than this by going lower than that, uh, which will give you this. This one is close to 0 0.05, and so the critical region is bigger root of 41 or less than equal to 29. Find the probability that she's correctly rejected H0. Well, the probability of rejecting H0 is this value 
plus this value. Uh, and the probability of getting there twice is this thing times itself, and so therefore this is the probability. Next, we have another Venn diagrams question. I'm pretty sure this one is even easier than the last one. 50 members in total, P of C, 3P of A, so therefore Z plus 7 is 3 lots of Y plus 1. Um, now, this is a prob... Oh, everything's over 50, right? Um, I, does that even... Did I, I didn't need to do that, because I'm just going to times by 50 anyway. Uh, whatever. Anyway, um, P of not B, which is Y plus Z plus 18, I guess over 50, is equal to 0.76. Uh, so cool. Times that by 50, times this by 50. This is a simultaneous equation that I'm not going to bore you with. You get two answers. Um, you use those two answers just like before to find the third answer, and we're done with that as well. We've done this, guys. We've already done this question. Literally the same question as what they asked us before. We assume that the binomial distribution looks like this. We're only looking for one tail this time. We just slam some buttons in the calculator until we find something close to 0 0.10 this time, which is this one here. So that's the critical region. And then this is the probability of rejecting it. So it's just this times itself. We have our answer. That's all the challenge questions for stats done.